So, uh, Roger, tell us a little bit about social aspects of anhedonia. We've spoken about effort. We're sp yeah. speaking about reward learning. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about this vicious cycle and what happened with C19 pandemic. Yeah, and this is really an interesting part because it does speak to the, the social and the um, dynamic interplay between, among other things, reward circuitry and the subjective phenomenon of anhedonia. And I would say the New York Times made the word languishing the word of the COVID time. People felt a sense of languishing during that time. And it's often said that the future intrudes on the current. And when a person, certainly an animal, is put in a paradigm where there is the inability to anticipate future reward in a way that's predictable and or the animal is isolated, it results in a behavior that is thought to be representative of a disturbance in reward. Human beings who are less so much socially isolated but are actually lonely, we're going to talk about this a lot tomorrow, which I think is the great pandemic of the world, are more likely to evince a change in the stress response axis. It is a threat to be lonely. And all of the stress system that we talk about in depression, the HPA axis, inflammation, insulin resistance, the change in the uh, sympathetic system, changes the brain circuitry, the brain neuro signaling that results in the experience of anhedonia. Now we talk about different types of stress. Stress, how it affects human behavior, is sort of like a U-shaped curve in some respect. Absolutely. In other words, if you have no stress, that ain't so good. If you have too much stress, that ain't so good. So stress in of itself is part of human life. It's when the stress is chronic, unpredictable, uncontrollable, and severe. And when you have cuss, chronic, unpredictable stress, that's when you begin to see some of this adaptation that is actually a maladaptation. And the person begins to experience a motivation apathy, disinterest, and we see changes in the brain that mimic that. Uh, now, one aspect about this that I've been interested in as a, as a person, as an academic looking into this is the role of the inflammatory system. I know Vlad, you are as well, Absolutely. as well as the insulin resistance that takes place in this situation. You can see here some of the circuitry that Vlad was speaking to. In short, when you're in this situation, what happens is, is among other things, activation of the so-called pro-inflammatory system. Rather than looking at depression or anxiety as a pro-inflammatory state, which you could conclude it is, it's more of an inflammatory imbalance. Correct. And what happens is, is that the, the, the signature of inflammation is tilted towards more pro-inflammation. And what happens, which is really interesting, is that when you look at the brain, in a human being who has had their inflammatory system activated because of cuss, chronic, uncontrollable, unpredictable stress, or some other uh, reason, you begin to see a predictable change in brain activity. Specifically what you see is a decrease in activity in the region of the brain responsible for motor function, the striatum. Absolutely. And you see an increase activity in the vigilance parts of the brain. Mm -hmm. So it has a sort of evolutionary teleology, so to speak, in the sense that the animal, in response to inflammation, is staying put to preserve energy, heal the wound, and decrease susceptibility to attack. You and I call that anxious psychomotor retarded depression. And depression, complex phenomenon, but anhedonia and anxiety march in the same direction. We see this clinically, we all know that. When you look under the hood, there's a common substrate insofar as the circuits and networks subserving fear, subserving reward, are overlapping. 
in one effector that results in alteration of both of these systems simultaneously is the inflammatory system.